Jen. It's Kristen. Welcome to this new episode of the Explicitly Pro-Life Podcast. Today we're going to talk about a topic we really shouldn't have to talk about, but apparently the new Supreme Court justice doesn't know this answer, so I figured we might as well do a show on what is a woman, unpacking the gifts of being a woman and femininity. Um, we have invited uh, Timory Millington on the show. Many of you probably know Timory. She is the host of Trending with Timory on Relevant Radio. Um, she is a Catholic speaker. She educates folks uh, in areas of theology. She's an expert in responding to current trends of sexuality feminism, gender ideology. Um, prior to launching her show, Trending with Timory, she worked for five years uh, as the Director of Education and Outreach at Life Choices Pregnancy Counseling Center in San Diego. She has a master's degree in biblical theology, a bachelor's degree in communications media. Um, she graduated at John Paul the Great Catholic University. They're like the Franciscan of California, I guess. <laughs> um, her diverse uh, professional background includes public relations, consulting uh, as well. You can listen to our show and subscribe at Radio Trend trending.com. Timory, thanks for joining me today. Yeah, it's great to be with you, Kristen. We've gotten married and we're on Relevant Radio now, so you can find us at Relevant Radio. We have our daily program there now. I met you years ago, before you were married, before you had a baby, before you were like this big radio show host that everyone knows. Um, so yeah, like you have been just your career and speaking out um, you know, on these very important topics. I've just been kind of watching it. And I, I kind of see these clips. I'm like, I knew her. <laughs> um, but we've never really had, a, I guess, a long form conversation no, about really all of the topics that you usually delve into. Yeah, no, it's funny. So, when okay. Many so, times, but never formally. <laughs> yes. Yes. I know. It's usually like on my whirlwind trips to, to, to San Diego. And now you're in. Uh, uh, Michigan. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the confirmation hearings for the Supreme Court, new Supreme Court Justice, Kentonji Brown Jackson. Um, it was really interesting. One of the senators asked her to define what a woman was, and she said she could not define what a woman was because she wasn't um, a biologist. But then later she said that she knew she was a woman. And she knew her mother was a woman, but she couldn't speak for anyone else. Um, what were your first thoughts when you heard that statement? Is that something we that you find that's common now in our culture today? People just refusing to even define what womanhood means? Well, first of all, I thought it was incredibly incompetent on her part. We know that she was nominated because she's a woman. And not just because she's a woman, but because mm -hmm. she's a black woman as well. And, you know, with all That's due right. respect, I think it's important that we do state that. And so I did find it extremely offensive to women, many women who are celebrating her success of the nomination and now officially our mm -hmm. new Supreme Court justice. So I think that that was my first reaction. It seemed very ironic, but on a separate note, it was very clear that this woman was going to hold because of her response to a radically LGBTQ ideology on the court that rejects who women are, that rejects our potency as mothers, uh, that and that ultimately endorses mm. radical uh, sex change and bodily mutilation ideologies for children. I, that's what she said by refusing to say what a woman is, which is such a simple answer. A woman has two chromosomes of XX, you know, you have a bodily anatomy that matches your chromosomal reality and we have the potential to bear children. That's a starting point. And that would be simple. And you wouldn't sound stupid for saying that. So I think that she shows a significant amount of um, ignorance in the honor of her position as a woman. And I think she shows a significant amount of um, manipulation moving forward with her role as a activist on the Supreme Court of the United States, not as a judge. Yeah. I, I It was interesting, too, because in December, for the Dobbs v. Jackson Women's Health Organization case, Justice Sotomayor, 
you know, who's a Supreme Court justice, um, very well educated. Uh, she kept arguing that no one could define when life begins and that <laughs> saying that, you know, children in the womb have value is simply, a, a you know, and that their living is just a religious belief. And I actually had this shouted at me uh, not long ago at, at a university of saying that a woman uh, saying that a child in the womb is living is a religious belief. And I was like, no, it's a scientific belief. Uh, you know, it, it, this conflating of ideas, like, and I'm like, no, my belief that the child in the womb has value, you can argue is a religious belief or a philosophical belief, but not that it's living like science proves this. It's, it's not a belief. It's, it's undeniable. Um, dead things don't grow in coordinated fashion, but it's unbelievable the lengths at which they're now going to deny reality and basic biology. Mm -hmm. um, where is where is this coming from? Like, I think a lot of people are like, wait, what happened to our society? Like, where did this all start coming from? Like, and why is it coming so fast? I think that this culture of ambiguity and outright disorder, it's a rejection of who we are as people. I mean, this is seen in the gender ideology movement. It started with feminism. And it's fascinating because it really started with the pro-life issue. I mean, if you take it all the way back to uh, the whole idea of the feminist movement, first wave feminism, feminists were pro-life and they wanted to advocate for the perspective of mothers, wives, women, and children in the public square. Mm -hmm. And suddenly it turned into second wave feminism, yeah. which was this absolute rejection of our ability to have children, you know, be freed of your bonds of fertility. And with that came contraception and the fail safe of abortion. And with that, it allowed for the breakdown of the family. I mean, if you follow the court cases, Kristen, you know, you saw um, Griswold versus Connecticut, the decriminalization or, and the widespread use of hormonal contraception, well, you saw right on its heels no-fault divorce starting in California and it swept the nation because you mm. took babies out of sex and sex out of marriage. You no longer had what would uphold the society and that was the family, the fundamental unit of society. You know, it opened the doors for everything from infidelity to ultimately the rejection of well, who am I? What am I made for? All of us desire love, but what is love? What is marriage? And is motherhood something that is still a fundamental part of the human person or not? Where do we go? I guess, where do we go from here? I mean, how do you, for a, a pro-life activist who's tuning in, listening or watching, who's having a conversation with a pro-abortion person and they're talking about supporting women, helping women choose life to feel empowered, going through all the lists of all the things that we as a pro-life movement uh, do and try to provide for women facing unplanned pregnancy situations. Uh, how do you suggest we respond when the person we're having the conversation with says, you need to back up here and stop saying woman. You need to say pregnant people because men can have babies too. <laughs> I have some responses that I like to use, but I don't probably think they're probably the most uh, philosophically sound or most charitable. So I would like to know from your opinion, what's maybe the better way to respond? Kristen, I think we have to laugh at this. I think it really is important when someone's like, you can't okay, well, that's refer what I to do, woman so. as a person. Right, I laugh. I think we need to laugh. Because it's ridiculous. And even yeah. if we look at the example of Will Thomas, who identifies as Alita Thomas, who is now saying he wants to go to the Olympics and is a clear man competing with women, you have to laugh at a certain point. Look at him in a bathing suit. He is not a woman. And I think that, you know, we're not trying to be mean to Will Thomas, who's clearly suffering from gender dysphoria and is desiring attention and is feeding off of attention. But we have to laugh at the situation that we as a society have adopted mm -hmm. pregnant people as terminology. I think even in the UK, they're actually encouraging midwives and nurses to use the word pregnant people. Uh, I think that it's mm -hmm. fascinating to see. And we need to say, like, be honest, this is funny and this is fascinating that you say that. Uh, but push back. No, we have a biological reality. We can appeal to science that a woman is a woman. We can appeal if someone's confused about their gender, 
or maybe there is an ambiguous genitalia that a person is born with, you can look at the chromosomes. And it's very, you know, from there we can go from understanding the truth of the human person, male or female. It's not just religion that gives us an answer. Although we were created by a God and God, that creator had a purpose for us. And that purpose does uh, come to fruition through our femininity and through our masculinity. Uh, but you don't have to appeal right away to God if the person you're talking to maybe isn't there yet. Mm, that's awesome. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm glad to hear that I'm not doing the wrong thing when I start laughing because I can't help it but <laughs> laugh when I hear yeah. some of these statements. Yeah. It's 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 unbelievable the lengths. I mean, we hear this a lot in, in those who support abortion. The lengths at which they go to just to deny biology and to yeah. oh, deny yeah. just fundamental truth. And then we yep. hear this. It's not, you know, a man can be pregnant. A man can have a have a baby. It's just unbelievable some of the it's statements outrageous. that we hear on campus. And I would really... I would really encourage you not to like give into that and be like, Oh, I'm sorry, pregnant people. Um, mm -hmm. I think it does a disservice to, to women. Um, Absolutely. and it's, it's, you know, you talked about Will Thomas, like, and Leah Thomas. I mean, it's, it's the erasing of women and uh, college sports. Yeah. Um, I mean, we, we are superheroes as yeah. women. Right. Oh, yeah. no. Uh, mm -hmm. Girls, women, young girls, little girls are being robbed because there are parents who probably won't put their kids in sports now because they don't want their kids in locker rooms with little boys. They don't want their daughters to mm -hmm. experience unfair advantages. They also don't want their daughters to be with people who might have an attitude of um, swinging both ways sexually and be confused about their sexual identity. And we're robbing girls of the potential of playing sports as well as of championships. And, you know, we have to laugh, Kristen. I come back to that. You hear phrases like glucose guardian instead of saying sugar daddy. Uh, you hear phrases such as chest feeding instead of breastfeeding. Wait, 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 wait. Glucose guardian? <laughs> what is that? <laughs> Glucose So you can't say like... Um, wait, is that for real? Yeah, you can't say sugar mama and you can't say um, like... You, you can't say gold digger. You got to talk about someone like a glucose <laughs> guardian. It's gender neutral. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> I'm going to totally use that for my husband. <laughs> I'm his glucose guardian. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Sugar All right, keep mom. going. That's a new one. I, <laughs> sugar, you can't, are, I can't say sugar mom and, anymore. I am the glucose guardian. Glucose guardian. You're like, I will accept that and appreciate it. But, I mean, we're, we're neutering everything. And what's scary, Kristen, is as much as we mm. can laugh, we can laugh, but at the same time, I mean, what came out of the Biden administration over the last couple of weeks with the endorsement of bodily mutilation, that is sex changes and cross-sex hormone, uh, so-called therapy for children. And we're talking about using hormones in children who haven't even gone through puberty, where we are blocking their bodies from ever going through the natural normal process, the development of the body. And we're also talking about stretching and manipulating skin. I was just talking to a plastic reconstructive surgeon on my show Trending this week. And we were talking about what the difference between top surgery and bottom surgery are and the stretching and manipulation and use of skin, the absolute removal of the full anatomical uh, reality of the woman's body and potency to have children. She will never breastfeed. She will never have children. You know, a time at 13 years old when she was confused and uncomfortable in her own body will render her unable to have children and will now have to be on hormone replacement therapy the rest of her life. And we're just talking about the medical impact. We're not even discussing the psychological impact with an issue that, as we know, the studies come out over nine out of 10 kids who are struggling with gender dysphoria, if left alone, not ushered into any sort of LGBTQ ideology or identity, they will work out their sexuality on their own and they will choose the sexual identity that matches their biological reality. And so, I mean, we laugh on one side and I think that's important in the face of the insanity we're seeing, but we have to aggressively and compassionately while telling the truth, approach this issue and not allow kids to be completely mutilated moving forward. I was um 
talking to my son and daughter, CF doctor, who's a brilliant woman and an amazing caregiver. And we travel across the country to, to see care with her. And she's on the opposite end of pretty much everything that I believe, mm. um, spiritually, politically. And I had mentioned to her that we had flown in the other day to Chicago to see her from Texas. And she was like, Oh, how brave of you to be in Texas. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, women aren't dying in back alley abortions and they still have jobs. And I didn't know she was referring to, uh, the Texas Harpy law, but I actually think she was probably referring to the recent law that was passed here in Texas about the transgender mm -hmm. hormone replacement therapy in children. Mm -hmm. Um, have you been talking about that recently on your show? Because you forgot that there's the, there's the not don't say gay bill in Florida that I hear so right. much about that really wasn't a thing. Um, what, what are you hearing? Cause it, it's fascinating. Cause I'm like in Florida, the law is like, just don't talk to kids about sexual orientation and expression from K through three. Like who right. is doing that normally? Right. We're talking about three-year-olds to eight-year-olds, right? I mean, third grade goes up to about eight years old, if I'm correct. So we're talking about in the state of Florida where teachers just aren't supposed to talk about okay. LGBTQ topics. That's how simple the law is in Florida. But they turned it into the so-called, what most people know it as, don't say gay bill. We're talking about three-year-olds to eight-year-olds. I shouldn't even be talking about anything gay, pro or anti-gay in front of a three-year-old, five-year-old, six-year-old, seven-year-old, eight-year-old. You know, I remember... Kristen, yeah. I have a dearly beloved family member. We have a number of family members um, who have experienced same-sex attraction and lived those lifestyles. And uh, one of them is my beloved uh, great uncle. I grew up with him. He, um, I, you know I was a dancer. I danced with the Russian Ballet Company in Washington, D.C. in high school, and he trained me. He danced with um, the Bolshoi in Germany. Uh, he was a top dancer and choreographer. He danced with Marilyn Monroe for a time incredibly talented, uh, but he had same-sex attraction and lived a gay lifestyle. And I remember I was a really little girl, little enough to be hanging out underneath the table at everyone's feet while everyone's talking. And I see my uncle has this beautiful silver metallic nail polish on. And I pop up from underneath the table and I say, I love your nail polish. Can you paint my nails just like yours? And I remember getting in the car that day. I don't remember what my mom said, but she said nothing about being gay. She said nothing offensive. Um, whatever her response was, it was very simple. And I respected my uncle my entire life, but I did grow to know and understand what was wrong with the lifestyle he was living. And I think that this is the reality that when we talk about this don't say gay bill approaching three-year-olds to eight-year-olds, we're talking about age-appropriate conversations, ones that we are having to have as parents with our children mm. now because of what's happening in society surrounding the, uh, what would I would say, science experiment on the backs of children with regard to cross-sex hormone replacement and bodily mutilation through sex changes, but it's a political ideology that's being experimented on with children. And so that's why with what's happening in Texas and in Florida, we need to be able to respond and obliterate the language that they are using. This is about children, and this is about telling the truth about the body and not sexualizing kids. And I think that, Kristen, that's kind of what's so scandalous about what's come out uh, regarding Disney over the last couple of weeks as well. Yeah, I mean, I was watching the leaked footage from the Disney Zoom video, and it was fascinating to watch this uh the activist they had on who was like, they're not going to stop with the don't say gay bill. Like next they're going to come after you. And it was, it was a, it was really interesting to see from their perspective, um, the, the scare tactics that they're, they're that they're deploying. Uh, but also some of them, I think really feel that way of saying that you can't talk about gender expression to a kindergartner means the next step is they're going to imprison you if you are living a gay lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that's a pretty sad statement that that's the thought process that that they think that those of us who think that a kindergartner shouldn't be talked to you know talked about by a stranger or to by someone who's teaching them about you know sexual identity that that means we also want to imprison people. Mm. And for those who don't was, know what we're talking about, 
Yeah, I think for those who don't know what we're talking about, we're talking about Disney and undercover footage from meetings at Disney have, have come out, mm -hmm. and this hasn't been covered in the wide in the mainstream media that Disney one has made it their mission to see the so-called "Don't Say Gay" bill overturned in Florida, and that they have been intentionally incorporating as many LGBTQ characters as possible. I mean, characters kissing, and it's scandalous. It's scandalous for kids. But what we saw, like you said, when they try to claim that we, who believe that our, our kids shouldn't be sexualized or that we shouldn't be forced to see two men or two women making out on the TV screen in front of us in a family-friendly film, uh, mm. they think that we're coming after them for that. And that's sad, Kristen. I think that uh, it puts, especially mm. if we hold to any um, Christian Catholic worldview, it puts us at a point where we have to remember to have compassion because they are, they may be afraid or they may have severe psychological trauma that they went through as children. And so we do have to be uh, compassionate, but help them understand, no, this is simple. It's about not sexualizing kids. It's about not scandalizing us. And it's also about not condoning, even if for adults, behavior that we know is medically harmful and psychologically harmful as well. Absolutely. I think that's really great advice for all of us because I think that that, you know, all of us, you know, who are listening have probably seen for sure, you know, or know, you know, someone in our life who is um, struggling with same sex attraction or living a gay lifestyle. Um, and I, and I think that that's something that we definitely, um, have to make sure of how we're communicating our message and truth and love. I guess, how do you, what's your best advice, you know, beyond the laughing at the crazy and the trivial, uh, comments that they'll say about what is a woman, how do you think we should as pro-life activists, many of us as Christians, how do we safeguard, uh, become guardians of, uh, femininity? And making sure mm -hmm. that, you know, true re feminism reigns, that a woman is celebrated for who she is, um, and it's not something that's that's that becomes gender neutral. Yeah. I think it first has to start with, as women, we can't be afraid to be women. I think that's a really important starting point. You know, what mm -hmm. we have to offer, whether it be the workplace, our families, you know, the educational environments we find ourselves in. We have a lot to offer you as you, as a woman and as an individual woman, mm -hmm. you have so many gifts to offer. And, you know, our potency for motherhood mm -hmm. is at the heart of who we are as women. I mean, even if we look at the health of our bodies, it is determined, our health is determined upon our capacity to actually ovulate and carry children. And the whole science of natural technology is phenomenal. And it's hidden and it's hidden because of this gender ideology. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think that that's profound. So I think we have to start with understanding and respecting. It's okay to be a woman. It's okay to say, I want to be a mom. It's okay to say, I want to be married. It's okay to say that I want to be a full-time mom and a housewife. Oh, It's okay to say mm -hmm. things that some people try to claim make you look less than ideal in a workplace environment. You know, I've had, I had an experience recently where, you know, I had to address that, you know, being a mom mm -hmm. and prioritizing motherhood as a working professional as well, um, you know, I think that these are conversations that are really important uh, that mm -hmm. a lot of people shy away from because they think to in any way bring up their womanhood is a degrading, which is funny because we live in a culture, Kristen, that is so okay with being nasty with regard to how we talk about women's health. But then we're very hesitant to say anything about our desires as mothers or the gift of motherhood. Mm -hmm. Or even to be real about how it's hard to balance life as a mother. I mean, those are the conversations we shouldn't be afraid to have. True. Yes. Absolutely. Do, what do you think about, um, I had this pro-abortion protester at college recently start yelling at me about the state of sex education in Texas, that women didn't know where their periods were coming from. They didn't understand ovulation. And I was like, you know, that's a great point. Like, that's a problem. Like, do you feel like we need to do a better job of really educating women about what their bodies do and can do? Like, I do feel like mm. there's a lack of knowledge in, in right. many regards to what is ovulation and, and, and really, really understanding and appreciating our bodies, which is what leads to so many getting on 
you know, a chemical contraceptive drug and then, you know, suffering the effects of infertility and not understanding Mm -hmm. why uh, they're unable to conceive or carry to term after numerous miscarriages and, you know, 10 plus years on the birth control pill. Do you think we, we have a more work cut out for us there, especially as I'm thinking, you know, thinking about a post row America, where we're going. Is that somewhere you think we need to be focusing on? Kristen, you hit the nail on the head. I do. I think that the reality of our bodies is so important. And we live where, you know, we have our cell phones in front of us all the time. We're very unaware of our surroundings. We're unaware of how we feel about ourselves. And we're all guilty of this. Uh, uh, We're unaware of just Mm -hmm. the basic functions of the body. It was interesting. I was reading Mm -hmm. a blog the other day. It in you know, it could be scandalous to talk about, but even just how um, in sexual intimacy, uh, women don't know how to properly experience pleasure and how that becomes a real problem uh, within marriages because women um, don't actually know like the importance of experiencing and how to experience pleasure because we don't know a lot about our bodies. And that's one, I think, end of the spectrum that we could touch on that, you know, helping women to understand that, to understand um, how their bodies function when it comes to cyclically, that you can't get pregnant all month long and that, you know, God did design the human body to have the capacity to engage in intimacy when you can and can't get get pregnant and these are really important things and I mean, even from my perspective having had health issues that surround my cycle and my ability to have children and carry a child to term mm-hmm. you know if i didn't know about napper technology and understanding my body better i wouldn't have known i needed progesterone to help me get pregnant or to help me sustain a pregnancy And there are a lot of people suffering today because of their lack of understanding and knowledge when it comes to their body. And yet we're all about hormones and manipulating bodies, but bodies that we very know very little about as women individually. That's that's right on. And I I do think, you know, this is something that all of us need to be thinking about in the post row uh, world of, of teaching women to appreciate their bodies, understand their bodies. I think there's a lot more work that we can do. Um, also, apparently, how to enjoy sex as well as a married woman. Um, that's like we a went podcast there. for another time, Tim Marie. Uh, we you went can there. Ask someone Sometimes else I for go that there on campuses. <laughs> yeah, no, I had one time, I remember a student who got up and screamed at me in the middle of a speech and was like, what have you just never had an orgasm you've just never had and i was like what like she reduced my anti-abortion views to the thought that she thought i wasn't having pleasurable sex with my husband and it was really funny because my husband was watching the live stream so then he began texting me funny comebacks and i was like and so you can see the video of me just laughing because i'm reading his text messages to me as i'm trying to respond to this woman but it was so interesting that she thought that I was this negative anti-abortion person. So I wanted to take women's rights away from them because I couldn't feel pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, no, I don't think sex is our problem. Like we're the ones who like fill up big van loads of kids <laughs> and we're the ones having a lot of kids. So I, it's very definitive proof that we do have a lot of sex. And there's actually been a lot of studies that show that yeah. Uh, Christians in committed relationships have the most pleasurable sex. Yeah. Um, and so, like, and that's like secular, you know, secular studies. It's not, of course, I, I couldn't imagine, yeah. like, well, I couldn't funny. imagine, like, relevant radio or EJTN <laughs> commissioning that study. That, that would be pretty funny. <laughs> Hey, we talk, we talk about it on Relevant Radio. Listen to Trending with Timmy. We do talk about these things. You know, sometimes I'm like, am I allowed to Damn. talk about this on Catholic Radio? But we do. And I think that that's where, you know, I think that's a great example. I have a responsibility to try and have a conversation appropriate to those who are, li- who are listening. Same with the state of Florida and how they're talking yeah. about LGBTQ issues. We always have to be mindful. Here on a podcast, we can talk about sex and throw the word around a little bit more often because a person can pause and play and listen at their own discretion. Mm-hmm. And it is explicitly probably a podcast, so I can even drop in a curse word or two and no one gets too angry <laughs> at me. So just a little bit, just my mom. So, hey, Tim Marie, thank you for coming on today. This was a great discussion. I'm really uh, excited for everyone um, to kind of hear and digest this conversation. Hopefully start tuning in to Trending with Tim Marie on Relevant Radio and follow your podcast as well. Um, because I, I think there's a there's a large discussion going on out there and that it's not separate from 
uh, the issue of abortion and that it, I think it was very important some of the things that you brought up about how these issues actually go hand in hand and are our reject result of the abortion culture that we have so thanks for all that you're doing um, thanks for being a leading voice on the radio and I can't wait to tune into your next show thanks Kristen it was great to be here